Well, good morning, South Union, and welcome back to another wonderful Lord's Day. Welcome to each and every one of you who are here with us today. Welcome to all of our guests and all of those who are listening in online, now or at a later time. Welcome. Let us bow our heads in a word of prayer. Our Father, we thank you so very much for your goodness and your love, your strength and your kindness. We thank you that you are the creator of the world. We thank you, Father, for creating us. We thank you so very much for the blessing and gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross to make atonement for our sins, who rose again from the dead to conquer the grave and to conquer death and be a trailblazer of the faith that all who might believe in him and follow him would not perish but have eternal life. Father in Jesus, we thank you so very much for your precious Holy Spirit who dwells in us like a temple, a down payment of our salvation and guarantor of our inheritance. We thank you. Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this place and you are welcome among us, of course. And I just pray that you would work in our hearts and that you would minister to us this morning. Father, would you please teach us through your Holy Spirit something that we need for today, whether in a word of instruction, a word of command, a word of rebuke, a word of knowledge, a word of encouragement, whatever you may have for us here this morning. We pray that you would give it to each and every one of us. Now, Lord God, we place this sermon and we place this time in your hands. May it be pleasing in your sight. In your name do we pray. Amen. What will you give for the sake of the gospel? What will you lay down or refrain from for the sake of the gospel? What sacrifice will you make to please the Lord? These are the driving questions that we ask and we will continue to ask as we work through this section of 1 Corinthians. Last week, we specifically looked at discernment in the gray area of life by working through 1 Corinthians chapter 8. And we saw this principle of laying down our right to do something for the sake of the gospel. Today, in chapter 9, we are going to see Paul illustrate this principle. So I want to leave us today with the ability to think through our lives in light of the call of the gospel based on the text that we have for us. And here we then come down to 1 Corinthians chapter 9 once again. 1 Corinthians chapter 9 in its entirety is an illustration of the do not make anyone stumble principle from 1 Corinthians chapter 8. And here we can get easily lost because in the text of 1 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul is going to work like this. Let me, let me give a running head start here. Chapter 8, discernment of the principle, do nothing to make another Christian stumble. Entrance into 1 Corinthians 9, he wants to illustrate this point chapter 8, by saying, I have laid down my right to charge for the gospel by making my living off preaching the gospel. There's a problem. Since he has already laid that down, nobody knew that was his right to have. So the first step of chapter 9 is actually he's going to be arguing, I and all the apostles have these sorts of rights, and specifically, the apostle has the right to make a living and be supported by the gospel. That's going to take up 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 1 through oh, 13, right around there, 14. Then... In 15 through 18, he's going to say, but I have laid that down as a what? As an illustration of 1 Corinthians chapter 8. 
Next week, he's then going to go on to a different way of explaining that same principle, that same illustration and how it works. So that's an overview of what's being done in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. I give that specific overview so that you don't get lost in the weeds and you don't mistake this text as only being about paying a minister or paying an apostle. That's actually not the main point. The main point is the illustration, I am laying down my right so as not to make you stumble. So let's now take this text and go through it together. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. First he's saying, hey, look, I am an apostle. Chapter 9, verse 1. Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Then he's going to describe the two principles that are needed to have an apostleship before the Lord. Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? In order to be a big A apostle, the first principle is that somebody have literally seen the risen Lord Jesus Christ in their historical body. Second, are you not my workmanship in the Lord? What's part two of that principle? That they preach the risen Lord Jesus so as to convert others to his name. Those are the two main principles of being an apostle, a big A positional, like one of the 12 plus Paul apostles is those two things. He continues his defense of the apostleship in verse 2. If to others I am not an apostle, at least I am to you, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. What is he saying? You're my proof. Okay, now we're not going to spend a whole lot of time in the weeds here. We're going to move along so we can get to the main point. Verse 3. This is my defense to those who would examine me. Okay, I am an apostle. Then he's beginning to lay out rights of the apostle with proof texts that he has those rights of the apostles. Verse 4, do we not have the right to eat and drink? Now you may be saying, well, duh, Paul, you have the right to eat and drink. Doesn't everybody have the right to eat and drink? The specific wording here implies I have the right to eat and drink at the church's expense. So we're talking about 1 Corinthians. Paul is saying I have the right for food, for sustenance from that church. Verse 5, do we not have the right to take, to take along a believing wife, as do the other apostles and the brothers of the Lord and Cephas? Or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working for a living? So Paul then offers two other questions. Number one, doesn't the apostle get to travel with his family? The, the expected answer there was, well, of course you can travel with your family, Paul. And Paul is implying but we have not made use of that right. Is it only Barnabas and I who have not, no right to refrain from working for a living? What's Paul saying? Because he's a preacher of the gospel, as are the other apostles, the church should give a return to Paul and to the apostles to support them in their work. And Paul again is implying, but we've already laid that down. That's why he's trying to establish the rights. Then he's going to list like four or five examples. So let's take a look. Verse 7. Who serves as a soldier at his own expense? The idea there is to have a, a soldier um, providing their own rations and without payment during a war. Right, So the idea here is you, 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 you're in the Roman Empire, you get called up to serve, let's say, and you could just imagine this person carrying about six months of food in a wheelbarrow from home, right, on his way to war. That's the idea there. And everyone's like, no, that's nonsense. It's not the soldier's job to supply their rations or to go without payment. They get paid. And he goes on to another one. Who plants a vineyard without eating any of its fruit? Right? The idea there is who, who, who would plant uh, the, a vineyard and not be able to walk through the vineyard and peel off some grapes and pop them in the mouth? Right? Who would not be able to earn a living off the produce of what they're planting and what they're using? And the third, or who tends a flock without getting some of the milk? 
the idea there again is um, you have a shepherd or a, a somebody who's tending the flock. Here it's most likely a flock of goats, and they're getting um, milk-based products from it. It's in the Greek. It says, "Who doesn't get to eat some of the milk?" Well, how do you eat milk? Well, no, it's milk and cheese and the products made from milk. That would be at question here. And they say, well, of course, they get to share in some of those things. And then Paul says, look, I'm not just using human arguments. Verse 8, does not law the law say the same? It's written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain. Is it for oxen that God is concerned? So the idea here is that the, the oxen is probably pulling the millstone or whatever, or is treading out the grain, or maybe it's just walking around the grain to separate it. And the ox gets to eat while doing that work and labor, according to the law of Moses. Now we find that in Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 4. Now let's actually turn there, because there's an important thing that Paul is doing in Deuteronomy chapter 24 and 25. The verse in question is specifically Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 4. But the rest of Deuteronomy chapter 24 and Deuteronomy chapter 25, as in the surrounding contexts, are laws that are all about human dignity and justice. So you have laws concerning divorce. Right in chapter Deuteronomy chapter 24. What's that about? Well, it's actually a law meant to protect the wife in this situation who is being divorced. Then you have a series of miscellaneous laws all about caring for human beings. Verse 14, you shall not oppress a hired worker who is poor and needy. Verse 16, fathers shall not be put to death because of their children. 17, you shall not pervert the justice due to the foreigner or the fatherless. Take a widow's garment and pledge. Verse 19, when you reap your harvest in your field or forget a sheaf of the field, do not go back to leave it. Leave it for the poor, right? It's all of these laws regarding human justice and dignity. Deuteronomy chapter 25, right? If there's a dispute between men and they come into court and the judges decide between them. Again, this is about human justice. Then in verse 4, you have this, this text that's just kind of like sticking out like a sore throat thumb. You shall not muzzle an ox when it's treading out the grain. Then what comes after? Laws concerning Leverite marriages, right? If, if, the, if the husband dies and the, and the husband has a brother, what happens to the wife? All of those sorts of things. Then more miscellaneous laws in verse 11. When men fight with one another and the wife of the one draws near to her husband. Again, it's, it's more about the justice between people and human beings. So Paul who's memorized Torah, of course, he would have had all of this memorized, is thinking about this principle of payment in light of Deuteronomy and is saying, look, God isn't really concerned with oxen in Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 4. Now, is it a law to be obeyed? Yes. Would it have benefited the oxen? Sure. But Paul is saying that the point wasn't about the oxen. The context would say the point is actually about human beings. And so he brings this in and he applies it directly to the situation in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and says, hey, look, this scripture is actually for us. Anthony Thistleton has a, a wonderful comment in his commentary. He says this, Paul uses scripture as a lens through which to understand the present as well as a light shed upon the past. One more time. Paul uses scripture as a lens through which to understand the present as well as a light shed upon the past. What's he saying? The laws back then were meant for our benefit, is what he's saying. It's spoken for us. And that's where he goes in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 10. Does he not certainly speak for our sake? It was written for our sake.
What's he saying? Yes, it was written to the ancient Israelites, but the Bible is for the people of God who believe in Jesus Christ. It was written for our sake. Then it continues on with even more examples. The plowman should plow in hope, and the thresher thresh in a hope of sharing the crop. Seems natural. A farmer sows seed in order to get something from it. Verse 11, if we have sown spiritual things among you, is it too much if we reap material things from you? If others share this rightful claim on you, do we not even more? What's he saying? Look, we sowed the gospel among you. We should be able to, and we have the right to, get something back from that preaching of the gospel, O Corinthians. And then he, he says, look, other apostles have already claimed that right among you. How much more so I, meaning Paul, have that right among the Corinthians in order to gain a harvest? He's going to actually continue on with these examples in verse 13. So let's get there and then we'll loop back to the finished verse 12. Do you not know that those who are employed in this temple service get their food from the temple, and those who serve at the altar share in the sacrificial altarings? This is referring to a blanket statements, a tremendous portion of Leviticus and the Levite, uh, the Levite laws around supporting priests. One example is Leviticus chapter 6. Verses 16 through 18, one of many. But the idea is that the priest who would perform the sacrifice actually by law gets a part of either the meat or a part of the flour of grain or a part of the cakes as part of their ministry to the ancient Israelites. That was so that the Levites could actually continue to do their work without going to farm, right? And there's issues if the Levites leave the temple, who's then there to actually take the sacrifices unto God? And so that whole system was meant to allow the Levites to be supported and the priests to be supported while on duty. Look here in verse 14. In the same way, the Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. That's fantastic. Remember, Lord here in Corinthians, especially in verse 8, or I mean in um, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, where we were last week, but also here, when he's using the word Lord, he's specifically referring to the Lord Jesus. So he's referring to something in the Gospels. Those places are places like Luke chapter 10, verse 7, Matthew chapter 10, verse 10, where the Lord sends out his disciples and says, go, don't take bag or purse or extra tunics or anything. Go and proclaim the gospel, heal the sick, cast out demons, and proclaim that the kingdom of heaven has come. And as they do that, the idea was that they were support to be supported by whomever first received them in that town. And so he's applying this principle. What is all of this about? Remember, the surface is the, the minister of the gospel is supported by the church. That's the surface there. What's the point? The point isn't that. The point is an illustration that he's getting to soon, which is, but I have laid down that right in order to not create a stumbling block among the Corinthian church. And it's so important to capture that. He's establishing his right so that he can tell people, I have laid it down. That's where he goes. Let's turn back a little bit to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 12. He says this, Nevertheless, we have not made use of this right. But we endure anything rather than put an obstacle in the way of the gospel of Christ. Obstacle there is, is a, a, like, imagine a um, military barricade preventing the, um, the oncoming enemy from getting through. That's the idea there of obstacle. It's a, it's a military um, metaphor. And he's saying, don't put up one of those to prevent people from growing in Christ or from coming to the gospel. Verse 15, I have made no use of any of these rights, 
nor am I writing these things to secure any provision. Paul lays it out, right? I'm not writing this to secure provision. I'm not writing this, and I haven't made use of those rights. What's he going to be saying? I have laid those down for the sake of the gospel. But you have to know that there was something that I had access to in order to see that I have indeed laid it down. Continuing in verse 15, For I would rather die than have anyone deprive me of my ground for boasting. The word boasting there is an interesting word. Um, it can mean boasting, but better thought of here is really the concept of glorying in. Right? And you could see how, how boasting or something prideful is a negative way of, of glorying in something. But Paul here is just going to be glorying in his work. Okay, And we'll get to why that is in just a few minutes. Verse 16. For if I preach the gospel, that gives me no ground for boasting. For necessity is laid upon me. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. What's he saying? There, there's, there's keys here that, that we need to have access to to be able to unlock what Paul is meaning. The first key is God's sovereignty. That God is sovereign and is able to do something from before time began. The second key is this. God destined and made Paul into a preacher of the gospel. In fact, the Lord took special measures in order to secure Paul as a minister of the gospel. That's exactly what he did on the road to Damascus. And so what Paul is saying is, by necessity, by the way that God designed me and purposed me, by the way that God destined me, I must preach the gospel. But if God made me and destined me for that purpose, then there's no glorying in it. Oh, what is it? Why, why is there no glorying in it? Here's the way it works. Again, this is another key. The key is grace. God gave his son as a precious gift to redeem sinners from the depths of hell in order to secure them as children of God. That death was a gift. The resurrection is a gift. The gospel is a gift. And Paul was a recipient of that gospel. Now, what he's saying is, I want to show my love to the Lord by giving something back. Not as a repayment, but as a free will offering, as a sacrifice, as doing something for the Lord. To show the Lord that I love him. This is this part of grace. The grace is the gift comes, then we, we give a free gift back, and a free gift comes. It's, it's all about the nature of love. Paul's saying, I want to give something back. But how can I give something back if God purposefully destined me to preach? Paul is saying, that's no gift. God made me that way. I couldn't do anything but do that. So what does he say? Verse 17. For if I do this of my own will, I have a reward. Meaning, look, if, if I do what I've been destined to do of my own will, then there's going to be a reward in there. And he's going to get to the reward in just a minute. So hold your thoughts about what the reward is. But if I don't preach of my own will, I am still entrusted with a stewardship. Regardless, willingly or non-willingly, he's going to do the task at hand. What then is my reward? Verse 18. What's the reward? That in my preaching I may present the gospel free of charge, so as to make not make use of my right in the gospel. What's Paul's reward? He gets to glory in the fact that he is doing something freely for the Lord as a sacrifice. Not by necessity, not by the way he was made, but as a free will offering to God, he is preaching the gospel free of charge. 
laying down his right, that's a sacrifice, laying down his right for provision in order to preach. That's what's going on in this text. Now, specifically, one of the things that we need to run back to for our practical application is this idea of the obstacle. You know what? Let's do that in just a minute. Let's talk about two practical applications. Let's talk about the surface level application, and let's talk about the deep principle application that we're being shown here. Let's talk about the surface application. Surface application is just very simple. It is good and right for a church to support the minister. Minister, Thank you so very much. You all do a good job. Glory to God. I almost say give yourselves a round of applause. Thank you so much. I'm serious. Give yourselves a round of applause. Glory to God. Thank you so much. You do that very well. Appreciate it. There's more to it than that, though. Here's the thing. Beware, and this is for your edification and your protection and your building up that I want to go here. Number one, beware of a minister who the first thing they do is ask about the benefit package. Any pastor who is in it for the money is not a true pastor. Now, we know, and just by common sense, that pastors do need support. All right? That, that's part of the ministry, right? But if the pastor's sole occupation is the finances, there's been a mistake there. Do not hire that person. I'm, I'm, and again, I'm, I'm telling you that just for your protection and for your edification and your upbuilding. Now, I want to go a little bit deeper. There is a systematic issue in the American church today, especially among clergy, but also in the congregational settings, and it's wrapped up around money. What is it? It's the idea that a pastor should have a career path. I talk in, um, in some of the circles I run, I, I talk with many different pastors, and some of the pastors use this sort of language. They say, well, you know, um, my, my administration or the people above him or, or in a congregational setting, they go, well, I am searching for an upgrade. I need to take the next step in my career path and orientation and get a, a bigger church and a bigger salary and more finances. Folks, that is completely antithetical to New Testament teaching and to the gospel. Pastoring is not a career. It's a service to the church. It is different than every other occupation. You need to be aware. The second way this comes out is actually in congregations. Um, and so I just... I, this is for your edification and upbuilding, but I also want to protect you and love you, and this is going to hurt. I have many times heard since my, I received my last degree, people say these things to me. So what's the next step for you? And what they mean is, well, now that you have this awesome degree, what are you going to go do with it? This hurts the body of Christ and the family of faith because we think that suddenly a minister who is being equipped for the service of the Lord needs to automatically go elsewhere into, quote-unquote, more important settings. There is no more important setting than the setting that the God has placed a minister to fulfill that specific task for the duration of whatever call God has called them to. Okay, that is some of the surface stuff going on. So what does this mean? Very, 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 very practically. If for whatever reason the, the recession made our giving shrivel and all of us were nickel and diming it into the offering box going, this is all we can afford. The recession is just so awful. We can't put food on the table and we're trying to also give to the church. What that would mean is this. I, as pastor, would not say, well, I need to go to a bigger church with more finances. I, as a pastor, would say this. Well, I do need to get provision, so I need to go get a full-time job, and I will tent make. 
I will pastor on the side to preach and teach and do the work of ministry as much as possible. And the church gathers together and fills in all those holes and we continue as a church. Why? The money isn't all it's about. Okay? And this is such an important and crucial aspect of thinking through the surface level of this text in modern society. Beware of pastors who are all about the money, number one. Number two, do not think it's just a career path for somebody. All right? Don't think that way. This is something totally different. Now, if you have a career path in a secular setting, that's totally natural and normal, and even good, I would say. It's just not that way in the church. Let's go to the deeper principle then. To get to the deeper principle, what we want to do is focus on verse 12. We endure anything rather than put an obstacle in the way of Christ Jesus. And the application for us as individuals is this. Do not set up an obstacle for stumbling for others in the gospel. Whether that they are Christians already and they're trying to grow in Christ or that they are non-Christians, do not set up an obstacle. This past week, we, we've over the last um, year, we've had this mound coming out from our house to the, to the street. And um, that was from where they, they dug up the, I don't know if, the right, if this is the right term, the sewage line that went from the street to the house, and they, they had that replaced. And um, uh, they, they piled all the dirt back in to fill the holes, and then they left this mound and said, wait a year for it to settle and then take care of it. So we waited a year, and it indeed settled quite a bit. So we waited a year, and it was kind of nasty looking for the last year. But this spring, we were finally like, all right, we're going to take care of this. So on Friday, I had a maybe a you know, five by five area left to do. So I'm out there with my shovel, right? Because that's how I was breaking up the ground. I'm out there with my shovel. So I'm, boom, whoosh, you know, doing that whole shoveling deal. And then, whoosh, and I ran into an obstacle, and the obstacle was a rock. And the rock will stop a shovel point no matter what. <laughs> it doesn't matter if it's a small rock or a big rock. It creates an obstacle that stops all forward momentum. And so the only way to get around it was to shovel those rocks out. Many times I misjudged the size of the rock, right? So sometimes I was like, oh boy, this is a big rock. And I would come like six inches back and try to get up under it. And I'd go straight in and rip it up. And there was like this little tiny pebble. <laughs> and then the other times there was like this, this much of the rock showing, a really small amount. And so I'd back up like three or four inches and boom! hit into another obstacle, and I back up, and it was like a rock like this size, you know, the whole ordeal. The idea here is, don't put obstacles in people's path. The reason being, it can completely shut down and block someone from growing in Christ, or somebody from um, coming to the gospel. Now, next week, we'll actually talk about the difference between gospel obstacles that somebody else has to occur and obstacles that we ourselves are setting up. And here we're talking about obstacles that we ourselves, by our actions, are setting up for other people, preventing them from coming to the gospel. There was actually a famous sermon by, um, maybe not a famous sermon, there was a sermon by Charles Spurgeon, who is a famous preacher, and um, one of those times he was telling a story of somebody who was converted under his ministry. And the man had waited like a near lifetime to come to the ministry. And Spurgeon was talking to this man and said, you know, what, what kept you, what prevented you from coming to the gospel? 
And he said, well, one day when I was a young man, an evangelist came to town and preached a sermon that just struck me to the core of my heart, and I was utterly convicted. So I volunteered to drive the minister home that night. I believe it was like horse and buggy sort of stuff. Drive the minister home that, that night. And on the way from one town to the next, the pastor wouldn't stop joking and laughing. And he said, and there was no room for me to be able to express the gospel. And he said, the, 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 the pastor was so, expressed so much levity about so many things, I could no longer believe the sermon they preached. And the question then comes for us this morning, are the jokes we tell or the jokes we laugh at an obstacle for someone else in the gospel? How about the language we use? How about the, with some of the ways we defend our opinions? I'm not talking about Bible truth there. I'm talking about our opinions. Some of the ways we defend our opinions, blocking somebody from the gospel. What are things that we do? For me, I think about parenting. I think about parenting a lot. So one of the ways in which this comes out for me in parenting is, how it, or am I putting up any obstacles for my children to come to the faith? And so one of the things that I must lay down continually is the drive to pull out my phone. Now, I'm of the generation where most, most of us are attached to our phones all day long, and it takes intentional effort to lay down the phone and make sure to intentionally engage my children and make sure that they don't just see me as people on the phone. How about for you? Is there an issue with you, with your children? Are you always on your phone when you're with your kids or grandkids? Do you always have the TV on every single time someone knocks or on, the, on the door or, or you answer the phone? Are you showing by your life to someone else that all that occupies you is endless entertainment or news? What are the things that we do that creates obstacles? The question for us in this area is this. Is there something in our life that could be an obstacle that as a faithful member of the gospel, I can lay down that right to do that as a pleasing sacrifice to God for the sake of the gospel? Let's pray. Father, we are so grateful and thank you, thankful for you. Lord God, we do pray that there is nothing in our lives that are obstacles for another. But if there is an obstacle, Lord Jesus, I just pray that you would convict us of that. That you would give us clarity revolve around that action. And that we then may lay it down as is appropriate in the appropriate situations. That nothing may hinder another from growing in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Or from coming to the faith. In your name do we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen.